All right, we're going to talk about hardware, and I'm just going to give you a brief history. Uh, we started out with punch cards, and if you notice on the punch cards, they're just simply cards that have holes in them. Uh, each time we have a hole cut in a card, that represents a 1. If there's no hole in the card, that's a 0. And this started back in the 1800s, and we just run those cards through a machine, and it would see where the holes were, and based upon the 1s and zeros. So that's why we ended up with a binary uh, for all our computers. It's all based on 1s and zeros. Well, <clears throat> after a while, we uh, went to the ENIAC computer, and for that one, it worked uh, by doing computations. The other one just could count cards, couldn't do any math. Well, this computer here allowed us to be able to do math. And how it did it, it used it using capacitors. You can see them um, right there. Uh, why we needed capacitors? Well, if we were going to multiply uh, 5 times 3 uh, in a computer, it's actually kind of difficult because the computer doesn't multiply, all it does is add very fast. And it would say, okay, well, um, 5 plus 5 is 10, and then I save the 10, and then I add 5 more to it, that's 15, and that's 5 times 3. Well, we had to be able to save the 10 somewhere, and how does it know how to do that? Well, it does that by lighting up vacuum tubes. If a vacuum tube glows, it's a 1. If it does not glow, then it's a zero, and that's exactly how it uh, kept the ten, and then add the next five uh, to it. Problem was very hot, a lot of energy, so we moved on to the next step, and that was using um, transistors. So transistors, as you can see here, that changed everything back in the late 50s and early 60s. All of a sudden, electronics got very, very small. And computers did the same thing. Computers became uh, tiny in comparison before they were filling up very vast rooms full of electronics with the vacuum tubes. And now they're about the size of a small car. Uh, the issue was that we couldn't send a car into space, so we needed to make them smaller still. And what was developed was capacitors. Uh, you can see here random access memory and the central processing unit. Everything's still ones and zeros. We're still holding charges or not holding charges like we do with vacuum tubes and transistors, except these are very, very tiny um, capacitors. So it allows us to be able to, uh, say on this chip right here, uh, have a million or uh, now even a billion uh, different capacitors on there to be able to hold those ones and zeros. Um. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about hi hardware. What happens when you start your computer? Well, the first thing you do when you start your computer is your computer has nothing in, no ones and zeros. All the capacitors are zeros because there's no power to them whatsoever. You turn on the computer, power goes to your uh, central processing unit. Uh, starts that up, puts the instruction set in, and then the next thing it does is goes to a chip called uh, your BIOS, uh, B-I-O-S, or Basic Input Output System chip. Um, that chip has the first par parts of your operating system, and that's the first instructions for your computer to actually do something with, and pretty much those instructions say, go to the next chip, which is, uh, which is CMOS. All right, CMOS, and you can see cloud complementary metal oxide semiconductor, um, holds the information on our hardware and how it's configured and, and what programs we use to talk with it. So uh, when you uh, have a computer for a while and say it had a regular DVD and I wanted to go ahead and install a brand new Blu-ray DVD, I would open up the computer, take out the old DVD, put in a new DVD, and then run software that would update my my CMOS with the instructions on how to communicate with that new device. Um, because it changes, we couldn't make it so it's hardwired like the BIOS chip was before. Uh, we had to have it so it changes. But the problem is, we turn off the computer, ones and zeros all turn to zero, and all that information would be lost. So the difference with uh, the CMOS chip is that we have a battery, and that battery allows it to hold the ones and zeros uh, while we wait. And you can see it's a lithium battery, and it lasts, it'll last much longer than your computer will. <coughs> 
All right, the last part of the boot process is we have to get the operating system that we're going to use, whether it's Linux or Windows or uh, iOS, depending on what kind of computer you're using. And that usually either comes from the CD or USB drive. And mostly for nowadays, it's, of course, your hard drive. So it just starts up by moving all the instructions for the operating system into random excess memory. And then the random excess memory goes up into the central processing unit um, and now we're ready to go ahead and start using our computer. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about, well, how do, we, how do we store that information? So let's go through. So that's the boot process, BIOS to CMOS RAM. Um, so let's take a look at, well, permanent storage, because I just talked about a couple of devices there where we stored our operating system. Uh, the first one is the hard drive, and that is magnetic storage. And it's magnetic because it has a uh, coating on it that we can either magnetize that coating or not. If it has a magnetized sector in it, then it's a 1. If it's that sector is not magnetized, then it's a 0. And we simply just change the settings in those um, sectors. And when a read and write head goes over it, uh, as you can see right here, um, it reads that and turns it into digital information, sends it to the central processing unit. Uh, so that or random access memory. Okay, the other kind of permanent uh, storage that we have is optical storage, and those are CDs, DVDs, and now Blu-ray DVDs. Uh, the only difference between each of them is uh, how close together the pits are uh, on it, and that's how it uh, works. Um, it shoots a laser at the surface. If it hits a pit and reflects back into a reader, then electricity goes down a wire, and that's a one. If it there is no pit then the laser uh, does not reflect back into the reader and it says okay there's nothing there and that's a zero and that's how we get the ones and zeros from a CD, DVD, or Blu-ray. And this is called optical storage because we're using lasers uh, to be able to store the ones and zeros. Uh, the last one is solid state storage and we're seeing more and more of this, a USB drive. Simply these are just capacitors like you would see in random access memory. Uh, the only difference is we have a technology that allows those capacitors to actually hold on to the ones and zeros or hold on to the charges until um, they change rather than when we pull it out of the device. So we pull it out of the device, the ones and zeros stay there without any battery to hold them in. Uh, in the future, and some of you might have high-end laptops that use um, solid-state hard drives. Uh, you can see a picture of one here. Uh, but in the future, we'll see that uh, a magnetic storage uh, will go away and be replaced with solid state storage in the future. It is faster. It is more reliable. Problem is, it's more expensive. So as the um, price comes down, um, you'll see more of those in the devices.